All right, so Smith mentions this idea of enthymemes. An enthymeme is just a fancy way of saying an argument with a missing or implied premise. You know, it assumes something that it doesn't state and it needs this assumption to be valid. Um, you know, enthymeme is just an argument with missing premises. You know, just don't confuse the missing premise itself with an enthymeme. An enthymeme is just a name for an argument that has a missing premise. All right, he goes through this pretty quickly. And it's a tricky concept, and we'll say a bit more about it when we get, you know, to formal logic in a few weeks, because I think it'll be a lot easier to figure out how to deal with these once we do that. But since he brings it up, I think we should look at the concept a bit more closely so it's not so mystifying. So let's look at an argument that is an enthymeme that very clearly has a missing premise. So birth control is unnatural, so birth control is wrong. Well, you know, look, logic, validity is all about form, so let's look at the form of this argument. A is B, so A is C. Birth control is unnatural, so it is a thing that is morally wrong. If we were going to use these all sum whatever statements that we've been talking about, what would fill this in and make it valid? Well, all B is C, right? A is unnatural. All unnatural things are immoral. So being an unnatural thing, A, birth control is immoral. Birth control is unnatural. Anything unnatural is morally wrong. It's our missing premise. So birth control is morally wrong. Now look, one thing I think should already appear to you guys is it's useful to know about this concept of missing premises, about enthymemes, because a lot of times the premise that the person won't state, the missing premise, will be the most dubious one, the, most, the one most likely to be wrong, right? Do you, you know, we have a valid argument here. Is it a sound argument? Almost certainly not, right? Do you really agree with the statement that anything unnatural is morally wrong? No, right? I mean, taking penicillin for a toothache is unnatural. None of us would agree that that's morally wrong. At least most of us wouldn't, right? So this is not a sound argument. Once we bring out the missing premise, we see that the missing premise this argument needs is not one we're going to accept. We see that it's not a good argument, and we see why it's not a good argument. All right. Our evidence shows that the victim's ex-wife, his business partner, or his sweet Aunt Betty committed the murder. We know the business partner didn't do it, so the murderer was the victim's ex-wife. We rework this a little bit to put it in our one, two, three form, you know, our, our premises with the conclusion at the end. The victim's business partner, his ex-wife or his Aunt Betty committed the murder. His business partner didn't do it, so his ex-wife did. Or remember, logic is all about the form. Validity is about the form of an argument. So let's look at the form of this one and see if it is, in fact, valid. A, B, or C, not B, so A. Remember, validity is about can the premises be true and the conclusion false? If you can imagine a way that these premises are true and the conclusion false, the argument's not valid, well, how could you imagine that these premises are true and the conclusion false? Well, it could be C, right? Not B means it has to be A or C, but to say for A to be the only possibility, we have to get rid of C, right? That's the hole in our argument. For the argument to be valid, we need to plug that leak, right? A, B, or C, not B, not C, so A. Now our argument is valid, right? We have eliminated all the possibilities except A. You know, maybe our detective just assumes Aunt Betty is so sweet she didn't do it. 
that would make him a bad detective whatever we don't need to think about that but we need to eliminate that possibility for this to be a valid argument the victim's business partner his ex-wife or his aunt betty committed the murder his business partner didn't do it aunt betty didn't do it missing premise so his ex-wife committed the murder from one two three right one a b or c two eliminate one of those options three eliminate another ex-wife is the only one left after we do that here's another example we are only responsible for actions that we can control and we should only be blamed for actions we are responsible for that's why we are not to blame for the emotions we feel right we're only responsible if we can control it well how does that get us to this conclusion we're not responsible for the emotions we feel let's put it in this one two three form to start with right we are only responsible for actions that we can control and we should only be blamed for actions that we are responsible for that's why we are not to blame for the emotions we feel keep rewording this translate it into this all some none language all things we are responsible for are things we that we can control all things that we should be blamed for are things we are responsible for no emotions we feel are things we should be blamed for now think about this we can do this find replace thing that I talked about before we replace first all things we are responsible for with a all A are things we can control. All things we should be blamed for are A. No emotions we feel are things we should be blamed for. Now we replace things we can control with B. All A or B. All things we should be blamed for are A. You know, now we can replace this things we should be blamed for with C all A or B, all C or A, no emotions we feel are C. Last thing we need to do is replace emotions we feel. Well, well, we just will replace this, I'll be unimaginative, we'll go with D, right? All A or B, all C or A, so D are not C. Now look, Think of this as a sort of a chain of dominoes. Like, what would tip over the whole chain here? Well, whatever it is has to be something that mentions D because we are missing this sort of bridge from D to C, right? But, you know, we want to connect where all this talk of all A or B, well, we also want to connect it with D somehow. So what would work? All A or B, and all C or A. Well, how could we show that no D or A? Well, if we assume that no D or B, right? No D or B, then no D or A from one or two. If all A or B and Ds aren't As, then Ds aren't Bs either. Well, since all C's are A, if no D's are A, no D or C from 2 and 4, right? Now, that might be really abstract. Let's see what it looks like if we actually write it out. All things that we are responsible for are things we can control. All things we should be blamed for are things we are responsible for. No emotions we feel are things we can control. Missing premise. No emotions we feel are things we are responsible for from 1 and 3. No emotions we feel are things we should be blamed for, for from two and four. Once we pop in that missing premise, it's like a line of dominoes. Everything else falls. It will often be that case with missing premises. Let's take this final one that, that Smith mentions and really doesn't dig into. He says this one has some missing premises. I agree with him, right? The constants of nature have to take values in an extremely narrow range, have to be fine-tuned to permit 
the evolution of intelligent life. So the universe was intelligently designed. I mean, the idea here is that, you know, the laws of nature could be different, and if they were the slightest bit different, the universe wouldn't allow life to form. Um, there's whole books on this, like, if gravity were a little bit stronger than it is, every star would just collapse into a black hole. If it were a little weaker, stars wouldn't be able to, most of them wouldn't have nuclear fusion. If the initial early conditions of the universe were different, everything would just keep expanding or it would collapse back into a black hole. You know, you tinker with some other laws, you won't get most of the elements you need to form life. This is a common argument, right? Constants of, you know, our two prim our premise, one premise and conclusion. The constants of nature have to take values in an extremely narrow range to permit the evolution of intelligent life. So the universe was intelligently designed. Now, look, you guys probably don't have the materials yet to see what the logical form of this argument is. Um, this argument uses this idea of a necessary condition. We will talk a lot more about that when we get to formal logic, when we talk about conditionals. But all of which is to say, and I think this will be more apparent to you guys you know, once we get there, but take my word for it for now because I do want to bring out the logical structure of this argument. Number one is best interpreted as an if-then statement. So we have to reword it a little bit to bring out the logic of the argument. If there is life, then the constants of nature must be fine-tuned to permit the evolution of intelligent life. So the universe was intelligently designed. If A, then B, so C. Obviously, this is not valid. There are a couple gaps here, right? So, you know, look. We'll talk more about these kind of conditional arguments, but how, what would be the best way to get from to C? Well, first off, we have this if A, then B, and, you know, A is there's life. That's a pretty obvious assumption, so let's just make that assumption. If there's life, then the universe was fine-tuned. A, our missing premise. B, right? We still don't have C. We have this gap between B and C. Well, what would plug our gap, right? Well, another if-then statement would do it, right? If A, then B. A, so B. If B, then C. B, so C, right? If we add this other if-then, then again we have this whole line of dominoes, knock one over, and the whole thing falls, right? If A, then B, A, our missing premise, B from 1 and 2. If B, then C, another missing premise, so C from 3 and 4, right? That's the form of this argument. Let's put it back in not so abstract form terms. If there is life, then the constants of nature must be fine-tuned to permit the evolution of intelligent life. There is life. I mean, there obviously is. I am talking. You are listening to me. We are forms of life. You know, nobody's going to doubt that. So the constants of nature must be fine-tuned from 1 and 2. If the constants of nature are fine-tuned, then the universe was intelligently designed. Missing premise. Or then the universe must be intelligently designed. Let's put it in a more strong way. So the universe was intelligently designed. All right, so and now is this now a good argument? It's now a valid argument. We've plugged the holes in it. You know, we filled in our missing premises. Well, you know, is it a sound argument to decide whether it's sound? We need to look and see if we think these premises are true. Two, there is life. Obviously, that's true. We can assume that. It goes without saying. No problem. And a lot of times when there are missing premises and arguments, the person isn't up to anything shady. 
it will be just be the case that it's so obvious you'd be an idiot to state it, right? Four, if the constants of nature are fine-tuned, then the universe must be intelligently designed. Well, is that premise as obvious as two? Is it obviously true that if the constants of nature are fine-tuned, you know, look, there's a lot of ways the laws of nature could be and a lot of ways that they might be wanting to allow life to exist, and they just seem to be in this narrow range that would allow life. Does that show that they must be intelligently designed? If the dials are all in the right place, does that show that there must be somebody up there setting the dials, right? Well, maybe not necessarily, right? It could just be that we got incredibly lucky. It could be that the constants of nature are just so that they're fine-tuned out of sheer random chance. So this is kind of what Smith is pointing at. He thinks this is a very dubious argument. I'm not sure exactly what Smith's religious convictions are, but, you know, atheism is very trendy among a certain kind of philosopher. I'm thinking he's, you know, it's generally fairly in the trendy group, right? So, now look, I'm actually not an atheist, but I actually think he's right. I think four is dubious. And I think this is another case where drawing out what our missing premises are it shows us, you know, what we should and shouldn't accept. It shows us where the argument might go wrong. Four is the weak point here. If a premise here is false, it's going to be four. Now, I do want to say one more thing about this argument, and it's not strictly related to anything Smith says, and it's not strictly related to the materials in this chapter. If you want to stop the lecture at this point, feel fine. All right, so assuming you didn't, remember that there are two kinds of arguments, right? And we are only talking about deductive arguments because we are only talking about whether arguments are valid. Now, this argument for fine-tuning for some kind of intelligent design, which is a really loaded term, you know, I, I agree with Smith, this is not going to be a sound dedu deductive argument because four is very, very dubious. But remember, there are two kinds of arguments. There are deductive and inductive. Now, we're not going to talk much about inductive because we just don't have the time. We need to focus on one thing, try to do that well instead of try to do everything. But I actually think that if you interpret this as an inductive argument or give an inductive argument in sort of the same area, you get a much better argument. The inductive argument might look like this. If there is life, the constants of nature must be fine-tuned to permit the evolution of intelligent life. There is life, so the constants of nature must be fine-tuned. If the constants of nature are fine-tuned, then the universe was either intelligently designed or the fine-tuning happened by random chance. It is incredibly unlikely that the fine-tuning happened by random chance, so the universe was very likely intelligently designed. This is not a valid argument because it is an inductive argument. Remember, no inductive arguments are valid. You know, Whenever you talk about likely or probably, you're in the land of inductive arguments. None of them are valid because there's always a way these premises could be true and the conclusion false. But they could still be pretty good arguments, and I actually think this is, you know, a pretty good argument. I, th I find it pretty convincing, right? You know, it's not a sure thing, but it does seem incredibly unlikely that gives us reason to think this is likely. Now, now, maybe I'm wrong about this. You know, maybe five is false. But I actually think, you know, five is going to be the point we want to argue about here. 
but you know the five here seems less dubious than four in the deductive version of this argument anyway if that doesn't make sense to you guys you know don't worry about it one thing I would say if you've listened to me this long though is there's a lesson here which is you know often we need to decide what kind of argument the person's offering and sometimes what might be a perfectly good inductive argument will be pretty stupid if we interpret it as deductive so we shouldn't do that I think Smith might be a bit naughty here to do this because most people who make this argument are not making it as a deductive argument because it has the problems he points out that 4 is very dubious but if you make it as an inductive argument, it doesn't have those obvious problems.